but it can also be used for professional development for those officials. So hopefully they can, they can look at that information and get better from it. Uh, one thing I do want to stress though is we, they don't know who, who's submitting what. We compile that information into an aggregate and we basically apply it to them anonymously. So, so they don't know what coaches are saying about them. They just know that uh, there's feedback being given to various coaches from around the state. For the, for the state playoffs, again, regular season exclusions are honored. Um, you have to have an approved or certified rating in order to call the state playoffs. And then those assignments are, are based on region. If, if uh, Southwest and Central are playing, we're going to use someone from a group from outside those two regions. Um, and then again, uh, the same official can't work the same school back to back weeks. All right, now I just wanted to get into a few points of emphasis for this year. The, the first of which is the, the new football practice regulations that we're going to hear. And just, just so you guys know, I know you've probably heard, heard this spiel before from me, but, but these regulations were not put in place by myself or the NMA staff. We got together a group of seasoned coaches, some administrators, uh, Buster from the Coaches Association, and we put together a policy that we thought would work the best for New Mexico. So we'll go through this step by step in a second, but just know that the National Federation, they, they are now looking to implement a blanket policy across the country for any state association that doesn't have their own policy in place. So I think we, we did a good thing, we were ahead of the game, we were proactive, and hopefully this is something that, that works for our state. It's not to say we can't look at it and tweak it after going through a year or two of, of a trial and error process. Uh, but this is something that, that I'm excited about. I think it, it came from you guys, so, so hopefully it'll work out well. Uh, again, this really is the only topic that I'll solicit questions on uh, right now. So if, if something comes up, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, so just going through it, week one, which obviously starts next week, August 4th. Okay, it used to be in the past, we had three days with shorts and helmets, and then seven days, full pads, go at it, so we have those 10 days before you play the game. That's changed slightly. First two days of practice are helmets only, shorts and helmets. Then days three and four can be shells only. Shells are helmets and shoulder pads only. Okay? And then the next two days in week one, so that Friday and Saturday, uh, you can't have full pads, full contact. The only thing is it's a maximum of 30 minutes per player per day. Um, real quick, there's a little uh, just so you guys know, there is going to be a, an official definition of what, what full contact is. And I know uh, that's something that the question that, that I've had already. Um, basically, full contact is described as, as anything where live action occurs. Live action is considered anything that, that you're doing that at a competitive pace and taking players to the ground. Okay, so that's the, the key words that you need to know at a competitive pace and taking those players to the ground. Uh, so the only way you have full contact is if you have live action, which is, of course, taking players to the ground. Uh, my question just was on the shells. A lot of kids wear the appendix girls with the pads, five pads, and hip pads, butt pads. Can they wear those on the short stage? Or no? Yeah. No. Yeah. On days three and four, it's just shoulder pads and helmets only. So, so no other pads. <laughs> Okay, uh, then, then once we get going after the first week, weeks two and three, so this is before games are going to be started, before regular season contests are going to start, you have 120 minutes of full contact during that week. Again, you have a maximum of 30 minutes per player per day. But on top of that, in both weeks two and three, you can have a scrimmage or a cleaner squad that does not count for those scores of 120 minutes. Now, it doesn't mean you get two scrimmages now, it doesn't mean one of those weeks. Question on per player per day. What's the team setting out? Not involved in the drill. Does the, does the drill minutes count against him? No. If he's not, it's just for the, and that's something that was talked about a lot with the group. If they're not participating in it, then that's not going to count towards them. It's just going to be for those those kids that are actually participating in a full contact drill. Uh, also, just another note for weeks two and three, when when uh. When you do have those scrimmages or those inter-squads, you do have to have that 10 days of practice before those kids can participate. 
So in week two, obviously, you're going to have to wait till Friday or Saturday to, to have that scrimmage or the box. Okay, and then week four, which is week nine of the anime calendar, when regular season starts through the end of the season, so once your, your team's eliminated, uh, you're going to have 90 minutes of full contact. Again, that's limited to 30 minutes per player per day. And these, this information will be on our website. I sent it out via email. I'll keep sending it out. Uh, but again, if you have any questions on this uh, right now, feel free to ask. And then if anything comes up after the fact, uh, feel free to call me. Anything on these? I'm just curious about, uh, you have uh, two days of helmets only. And you go two days of helmets shoulder pads. Why can't you wear the girdles? That's a safety. The, the way the policy was put in place is that it would be shells only. And, and shells, by, by definition from USA Football, is just helmets and shoulder pads. I'm just kind of having a hard time basketball players. They're not actually pads, they're just like little padding. Guys, I mean, I'm not going to be at your practice facility and watching and looking to see what you guys are wearing. If it's something that you feel comfortable with and you want to go through with it, I mean, uh, that's up to you guys to decide. Now, I'm just telling you what, what our policies are in place based on definitions from USA Football and what the committee came up with. Well, is there any way we can add that to the following year? The girls are okay. Yeah, we, I don't see that being a problem. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, we think you're missing is knee pads. That's it. Right. And their pants. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think what you're knee pads being not on the ground and that's the girls. And that's supposed to be. Again, thanks to the committee members. I know there's a lot of you in this room today. Thanks to, to those guys who were here to help out with that. It really helped us a lot. Uh, just a reminder on heat illness prevention protocol. It uh, doesn't happen a lot here in New Mexico, but, but I know down south we can get some hot days. Uh, just make sure that you're keeping an eye on that. The, the heat index, uh, if you have the, the humidity and the temperature, have a heat index of over 104. That's when you do have to shut down practice. Uh, when you have anything from 100 to 104, it's recommended that you modify or, or you shorten the, the practice. Uh, and then obviously just be proceed with caution when it's 95 to 99, and just always being aware. Uh, also, frequent water breaks, having a cold water immersion tank around, uh, those are all things that will help us protect our student athletes. Uh, if you have questions on this, you know, call me or you can go to our website. We do have information on there as well. Physicals, I'm sure you guys are already taking care of this since we're starting on Monday, but just a reminder that no student athlete can participate uh, without a physical and proof of insurance on file with the school. And lastly, concussion requirements per Senate Bill 1 that was passed several years ago. Uh, there is a yearly concussion awareness form that, that really needs to be filled out by you guys. Uh, you have to go through a course and you have to have your student athletes and their parents sign off on, on this fact sheet. Uh, that information can be found on our website. I'm sure your athletic directors have it as well. So just be aware this is state law and this is something that has to be done on a yearly basis. <coughs> <coughs> and another, another state law that we always remind you guys about is coach's licensure. Uh, any coach, paid volunteer, uh, whatever it may be, they do have to have a coach's license in order to be around the student athletes. Okay, next, uh, I want to talk to you guys about the mercy rule. This is something that, that came up in the sports specific. Okay. Sorry, Dustin, uh, off that subject real quick. For uh, kids that have their own helmet, where do I find that paperwork at to get that approved? Mm, I, I do not know off the top of my head. I'll have to check into that for you. Uh, the Mercy Rule. This is something that the Sports Specific Committee talked about in January. We had some feedback from a lot of coaches that they didn't like the current Mercy Rule, that we wanted to change it. Uh, so we did take a proposal to our commission and our board of directors. It passed our commission and it was not even really discussed at our board of directors meeting. So it's something that failed. Uh, so that proposal did fail. We will be 
using the same mercy rule that we have used the last couple years, which is a running clock when a team is up by 35 points any, at any point in the second half, uh, and then the game will be ended when a team is up by 50 points at halftime or any time in the second half. Uh, so again, it's something I know you guys were passionate about. There was some talk this morning about continuing to bring that back uh, to our commission and our board, so that's something you know I'm happy to help you guys work on moving forward. Uh, we tried this year and it, it didn't quite work out, but that's not to say we can't change that in, in the future. Okay, the enemy ejection policy. Just wanted to go over one thing that, that has changed with that ejection policy this year. Uh, and it, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, coaches, actually. This is going to be for your student athletes. Uh, in the past, if a, obviously if a player is ejected, they have to sit out a game and complete the sportsmanship course. If they have a second ejection, it was a two-game suspension and a meeting with the, the anime A and any other additional local sanctions that the school may put on an athlete. Uh, but this is something that, that was just recently added via referenda. If a player is ejected a third time, they will be ineligible for a full school year, for a 180-day school year or 365-day calendar year. So just know if you have a player that's ejected three times, uh, they are going to be out for 365 days. The policy for coaches is still the same. If you have uh, one ejection, it's a game of suspension, and compete the, complete the NFHS course that, that's on our website for teaching and modeling behavior. Jesse. Jesse. Yes. Correct. From, from their last, from their third ejection, yeah. So yeah, and it is cumulative. So if you have kids that participate in multiple sports and they get ejected three times across three different sports, they're still going to be ineligible for for a full year. No carryovers, though, right? No carryovers. It's just just one school year. Just one school year. Uh, just a reminder: out of season coaching during the school year. Uh, I, I have a ton of problems with this in the sport of baseball. I don't really see it with you guys too much, so I really appreciate that. Uh, but it is 7.5 hours per week the, of contact time. That has to be Monday through Friday. Uh, that, that's a one reminder I want to give you all. It's Monday through Friday only when school is in session. So out of season during the school year, 7.5 hours per week of contact time. That includes conditioning, weight training, film, uh, being out there on the field, running drills, whatever it may be. Uh, any contact time goes towards that 7.5 hours per week. Uh, and there, there's a ton of Q&A about this particular topic in our handbook. Uh, so if you want to take a look at that, it's in section 7.4. And lastly, uh, the, the ADs in the room that, that are also football coaches know we launched this yesterday. We're really excited that we're going to start a new sportsmanship initiative. Uh, we have what was called Pursuing Victory with Honor several years ago. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with that. Um, we have since moved to the NFHS sportsmanship course, and over the last year, we thought it would be better if we came up with something that was New Mexico driven, that, that was something that our state uh, put together. We, we had a sportsmanship committee of coaches, ADs, enemy staff, and we've really been working on this for, for about a year now. Uh, we actually did have some student feedback as well, so, so we're very excited to announce this new sportsmanship initiative. Uh, there are a number of marketing materials that were given to our ADs. And really what we're asking from you guys is just to buy into this new initiative. I think people really did buy into Pursuing Victory with Honor when we had it. Um, we've had a little hiatus since then. Uh, but we really want you guys to, to jump in and, and remember our slogan, which is compete with class. Anytime we talked about sportsmanship with our committee, the word class came up. Uh, so we, we thought this was a simple and quick way to, to really launch a sportsmanship initiative around the idea of compete with class. Uh, so just keep your eyes out for, for any initiatives or uh, any information on this program as we launch it this school year. The one thing we're going to need help, help with from, from coaches, uh, during our committee meetings, everyone said, well, we need to highlight the acts of sportsmanship that are going on across the state. We can't do that if we don't know about them. So, so what we ask from you guys, if you go down and, and you play in another city and the, the spectators welcome you or the coaches do a great job of, of showing you uh, respect and, and they're real classy about hosting you or if there's an act that a, a student athlete does on the field that you think we should know about, 
let us know. We, we want to highlight that. We want to recognize that kid. We want to recognize the schools that, that truly are competing with class. Okay, any questions for me before I turn it over to Paul? <coughs> All right, and then also, uh, within, in about 10 minutes, I'll start sending around the signing sheet. Uh, we have a couple different binders. You only need to sign one of the binders. Uh, just make sure you fill out your name, uh, sign it, and then also include your current email address. I'm trying to update our database as we speak. Uh, so if you're here today and you, you sign in on that, uh, you know, we'll have that moving forward. Attending here today is the requirements for, for the rules clinic. If you have any peers that didn't make it, the, the online version will be available on Friday. Uh, if you do not go through the rules clinic, there is a $100 fine. Thank you, guys. We could each just, each just give me 100 bucks and walk out of good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Paul Sandoval. I've been with the AFOA, the Central Region, since... Uh, uh, 96, I uh, had the opportunity to spend about 10 years in the RMAC as well. Uh, RMAC commissioner came out with some rule that you can't do college and high school together, so I'm here. So uh, again, uh, not a lot of rules changes uh, this year, but there is some stuff that uh, obviously we need to cover. Um, this one is more of an uh, administrative thing. I guess some states uh, have their crews out more than a half hour before the game. So this just allows them to have authority when they take the field. Uh, you know, I guess Miami and uh, Florida, could, we could thank for being out there for an hour early. I know uh, the college rule has a, the officials out on the field that hour before kickoff. So this just kind of accommodates those people that are doing that. Uh, the biggest uh, change this year is targeting. They're bringing this definition into the book. Uh, if any of you guys read the college rule book, this has been in there for uh, many years. It's basically just bringing that definition down into the high school so we can define, more clearly define what these fouls ex uh, actually are. So any, any contact, any contact to the shoulders or above is considered targeting with pretty much any part of the targeter's body. Uh, it's, it's actually a, a new rule that's in the book. Uh, they didn't just take personal foul and modify it. They made an entirely new rule. Uh, again, I don't really like this picture right here. To me, that's fighting. Okay, but, uh, you know, again, it's above the, the shoulders or above. Uh, here's another one throwing an elbow. If two guys are standing, two kids are standing there and he throws an elbow, I'm probably going to go with a, with a, with a, with a calling it a fight. We'll have to talk about that amongst our, our, all, the, all the groups, but uh, those are kind of questionable drawings, I think. Um, of course, the old forearm, you know, chopping him down. Just another uh, example of that foul. So again, it's pretty much any part of the body used to target the shoulders or above. Again, line play, you know, it would be ridiculous if we called guys in there. That's why they have a helmet on, so they don't hit their heads. Uh, again, you can... There's still a foul for punishing, for, for uh, uh, butt blocking is still a foul, uh, face tackling is still a foul, of course, spearing is still a foul. Uh, those can't happen in line play. Uh, usually, as, as officials, we, we try to talk to the players about that one first, because it's, you know, it's, it's close quarters, um, and, it, and it's, uh, it's tough to see, but you can read intentions for some of these kids sometimes, and those are the ones we try to correct. Again, targeting is, is an illegal personal contact foul. Uh, it'll have it'll have two signals. It'll be personal foul and the, and the illegal helmet contact foul signal is the two signals that you see. Even though it might not have been hit with the hand if it was a forearm or something, it's still the same signal. Uh, illegal kick status, they changed the, uh, the term of this. Uh, it used to say that if was always a fumble. Now it retains its original status. So if a muffed if a muffed ball is is an, is an, is illegally kicked, uh, then it's still a muff. Okay, that could become real important when you're near the goal line or the end line or something like that. Um, now, an il uh, illegal illegally kicked ball is an intentional act. So a ball that bounces off of a player off of his shin, if he's not trying to kick it, obviously that's not. A kick. Uh, 
Um, again, defenseless player is a new is a new definition that they added. Um, you know, the, the prone player on the ground, the guy 20 yards behind the runner, just kind of jogging because he gets yelled at if he doesn't hustle to the end zone with his teammates. Uh, those kind of guys, you you know, you, you've seen them 100 times. Peel back blocks. Uh, we've got some officials in the state that are really really good at seeing that stuff. Uh, we got some that not so much. So now. Now that it's a point of emphasis, uh, all the officials are going to be looking for those, those cheap peel back blocks. Uh, again, if a kid, you know, it's, it's, it's judgment on our part, but if the kid's not within five yards of the runner, what are the chances he's going to catch it? Okay, there's rare instances where you see a, a kid really flying, and, and that's our judgment. If we think if he has potential to catch him, and he gets blocked legally, blocked, then we're not we're going to pass on that. It's the guy that takes himself out of the play. Um, this is what I'm talking about. The guy way behind the play, just kind of lollygagging around. Just can't tee off on that guy. Even if it's a legal blow to the, to the front, uh, not involving the helmet, uh, not involving spearing anything else, it's still going to be a foul. Okay? Uh, now a, a kicker, a, a, a punter or a kicker is considered defenseless now until he regains his balance. Okay, it's always been a, uh, you could have a roughing or a running into depending on the severity of the, of the hit, but now he is a defenseless player which will draw a 15 out of uh, Again, another defenseless player example is a, is a wide receiver that has given up on the pass. Uh, if, he's, if he uh, lightens up, you can't just kill him, okay? And I think we've been pretty good about getting this as a, as what we call a cheap shot in the past anyway, but now it's clearly defined in the book. Uh, again, uh, uh, receiving a, uh, a, a punt or a kickoff, uh, he's considered defenseless again for the purpose of definition. You know, that's always been kick catch interference, but uh, now it's defenseless player definition. Uh, again, a guy laying on the ground, you can't pile on, that's kind of common sense. Um, here's one that you guys might see call and might get pretty angry. <laughs> if, if his forward progress is stopped and whether a whistle is blown or not, you know, we try to, we try to stop everything. But if, if his forward progress is clearly stopped, another guy can't come on and just, just wipe him out, okay? Uh, any questions on the defenseless player and targeting and all that? Um, this this rule change. Oh, sir. What, what is the impact? How is it applied on a crack block with a wide receiver or a split in on a linebacker? Uh, you're talking a motion man cracking the, the end, the defensive end, or something like that. I mean, he's not defensive as he's playing football. <laughs> okay. If if he's in the play, if he gets blindsided and it's legal, it's from the side of the front. That's not a foul. It's the guy that it's the it's the, the kid that gave up playing and quit running and that. Or he's already laying on the ground, he's out of the play. Okay. Um, I got it. I got it. On, on that one when the guy stop with the whistle doesn't go, what do you do if you let up and you don't hit him and he gets loose and scores? <laughs> I think that tape would be in Dana's office by by uh, Saturday night. But uh, uh, I, I mean no, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean the, the, whole, the whole point of the rule is don't hit a kid that's defenseless. Right. Teach a kid to not hit a defenseless player. Now, if there's no whistle there, I would, it would be hard for. If I was a white hat and a guy didn't blow his whistle and threw his flag, I'm pretty much sure we're having a discussion about what happened. Okay. Uh, that would be that would be a, a missed call. I mean, that would, yeah. Something like that would. I would, I would report that to the NMA. You know, we need to make sure we we as officials understand that. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, on time down rule, this one is a, is a big one uh, because, again, they basically took the NCAA version of on time down and brought it down. So in, in, in now, the time has to run out during the play uh, to earn an untimed down. Okay, so an example, in, in the past, if you had a, uh, uh, say you had a holding penalty on third down and we, 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 and we stopped the clock with uh, with 15 seconds ago, we mark off the penalty, clock was running, so I wind it, and that clock ran down to zero before you snapped it. 
Last year, you were allowed an untimed down in that instance. This year, you don't. Okay? So the, the clock has to expire during the play to be allowed an untimed down. Does that make sense? And it's a, it's a uh, uh, let me clarify, it's an, accepted, it's an accepted penalty. So if you have a penalty that's declined and the clock ran out, you can go to halftime. It's not required to play at halftime yet. So penalty must be accepted. Clarify that. Uh, this is a big one for uh, special teams, free kick formation again. Uh, all these things seem to trickle down from, from the college game. Uh, this is a little bit different than the college rule, and I'll explain why. Uh, after, my, after the white hat blows is ready for play whistle, all the kicking team must be within five yards of the ball, okay? Except for, except for uh, the kicker. Uh, he still has free range to do whatever he wants. Five yards from the ball? Uh, yeah, five yards from the ball. So I, don't say, I don't say it on the 35 because with a penalty we could be kicking from a different place. So the other, uh, the other new thing is you can't overload a side anymore. You have to have at least four at least four on each side of the ball. So that changes all your own side kicks. It has to be on the 35 yard line. Say again? They have to, their foot has to be inside. I'll, the I'll, uh, there's a slide for the feet. Okay. Then, then, yeah, I'll we'll get to that. Um, this one's talking about you can't have three on one side. Uh, that's going to be uh, an illegal formation, uh, dead ball foul, so we'll shut it down. Uh, obviously, we give you the opportunity to correct it before he kicks it, but if he's going to kick it, if it's imminent, he's going to kick it, we're going to shut it down. Uh, Oh, the illegal formation. Again, this this shows the uh, this shows a legal formation. Uh, four guys on either side, at least four guys on either side. Uh, here's one with the feet. So this is a little bit different than uh, the college rule. Uh, they have to be inside. They can't stand on the 30. If we're kicking from the 40, their foot can't be on the 35. It's got to be inside. Obviously, uh, this is new rule for us. We're obviously going to uh, talk to the kids. Uh, as you know, our mechanic is before every kickoff, we have an official on each restraining line. Uh, we instruct those guys to remind the players. Uh, so we're not going to ticky tack this thing, but you know, expect us to be talking to your kids a lot the first week or two. So, hey, you know, you need to be up here. You know, you need to be up here. We'll bang it into their heads and you know, they'll, they'll get it. They'll get it pretty quickly. Uh, they've, they've seen it in you know, the college games and uh, forever. So, uh, force, uh, accidental, accidental touching of a loose ball cannot create a new force now. That was more of a clerical thing. It was kind of confusing in the book. You could read it in a couple different ways. This is more of a, of a clarification. So any, any ball that's, uh, that is loose, that is accidentally touched, that touching is, is, is ignored, basically. For the, for the, for the uh, for force, the effect of force on that. Um, roughing the passer, they changed the definition a little bit uh, because of the uh, uh, defenseless player. He's considered out of the play of the pass if he doesn't move to participate. So if he, if he drops back and he throws the ball, and the guy comes by and doesn't smash him, but he reaches by and he pulls his face mask or something. Uh, that's still uh, roughing the passer, which is an important distinction because that's automatic first down. Okay. So in the past, I, I uh, in the past, uh, quarterback lets it go. I had this play several years ago. Quarterback drops, he's rolling out, he throws the pass, and the guy hits him. Okay. And the guy drives him, and the guy drives him, and the guy drives him, and he drove him about 10 yards and then buried him in the ground. Okay? I threw my flag, and the coach says, that's not roughing the passer. I go, I didn't call roughing the passer. I call it unnecessary roughness. Okay? So now my definition of that is defenseless player. So if he throws the ball and, and does not continue to participate in play, he's a defenseless player. And any, any action, any illegal action on him becomes roughing the passer, which is automatic. So that would be similar if, let's say, the quarterback with a lot of these gun formations that we use now, is he, is there a gun in a read concept and he lets the ball go and it's clearly gone, and the defensive guy kind of stutters and then comes and hits it. Is if, that going <coughs> call or would that be? Our philosophy on that is if he's, if he's doing it to deceive, then he's off. Okay. 
if, if he's doing it, I mean, running backs, you think handoffs all the time. Running backs don't the ball, the ball quarterback standing there, hands to his side, watching. That's one thing, oh, running back, he could do the disease, and he has the ball. You could hit so that guy. Is it, but the, the quarterback the standing there, the standing the there gone. he doesn't have the ball. If, you can if, clearly see he does not have the ball. Right. That's, uh, you guys are going to hate this answer, but that's a judgment call. Okay? That's a judgment call. I mean, I know how I would officiate it, but until you show me an exact play, I couldn't tell you if I think that was a foul or not. Remember, if he is out of the play, he's defensive. That would go for the option also? Right. Yeah, but, but if he he still has the opportunity to go box on him, right? So he's still in the play. So if you go, if you hit him legal, if you hit him legally, it's nothing. Um, quite a, quite a few editorial changes. That's it with the rules. Any questions on the rules? <laughs> Not too many changes, but some of them are kind of significant. Um, I'll go through these. You guys have probably seen this at every game where the officials go and move the pylons off the end line and go about three to five yards back off the end line, the hash mark. That's all that is. Uh, a couple of clerical things, changing justification to authority. Uh, standardizing the language on the, on the field markings. They, got, they put a specific uh, distance where to measure from to see if it's too close to the sideline. Um, I didn't get this one. They added head before lines, but you're going to see this one a bunch, so I'm just going to ignore it. But now they're calling them a headlines in the rule book, but I don't see that change in the mechanics book, so it's kind of confusing. Um, there's this huge rule on what a tooth and mouth protector is. And so the rule kind of now says you can't have the chewed ends on the back. It doesn't specifically say that, but in the definition of the mouthpiece, it describes exactly what it has to be. Uh, probably worth taking a look at real quick. Um, they added a new note uh, here that uh, uh, a kid can wear sunglasses underneath the, underneath the helmet. Can't be attached to the helmet. They have to be separate, but they could be tinted. Um, well, this last one is just uh, more than 30 minutes. We take authority of the game. This is just all clerical stuff. Status. Uh, Targeting, they added, uh, they added targeting to some of the headings, some of that stuff. I'm trying to think, I know there was a couple of report ones. Um, this describes the, the situation when the clock will be stopped. It talks about uh, when the receiver is carried out of bounds backwards. That was a change yet last year, or the definition change. This is just uh, uh, adding, a, a, adding a new, a whole new uh, a definition of that. Uh, appendix B is the concussion appendix in the case. Uh, this is a new one. This is a new one for delay of game. A new definition of delay game is failure to unpile from an opponent in a timely manner. So if the team's trying to, you know, trying to hurry up and the other kid's just laying there, we could, we have the authority to call delay a game. We we kind of had, I mean, there's kind of had that rule in there. But now it's clearly defined, so it's it's in black and white. Uh, again, the penalty for uh, encroachment. This is the four players on each side of the line. Uh, these are the important accidental touchings on the enforcers. That's what that one is. Talking about illegal equipment, uh, failure to wear required equipment during a down. Uh, it's clear, more clearly defined. Uh, so the, what it de defines a non-player for uh, a non-player for illegal equipment. So uh, the definition of a non-player is a is a is a, is a, is a, is a kid that runs on the field and has not become a substitute. Player. So for him to become a substitute, he has to communicate with the team. That's what we consider. Now he's a sub. That starts our that starts our, our internal clock for uh, a player having to leave because he's been substituted. Okay. So technically, it's a foul if a kid runs on the field. Hey Johnny, you're out. No next player. And then if I run out, that technically I have the legal substitute. Did you ask him to skip side? I'm sorry. Did you ask him to skip the side? Uh, I 
to get in. It changes. Yeah, that's where I'm on this one here. Uh, or not player for illegal equipment. So, uh, so if a kid runs in and doesn't, doesn't have his chin strap on and his mouthpiece out, technically he's a, a non-player in violation of the illegal equipment. All this stuff's kind of uh, clarifying. This clarification is uh, um, rules changes. Oh, that's uh, DPI. We moved DPI from awarding A to series down. So as we know, last year uh, OPI uh, DPI automatic first down went away. They just had it in the book still. They didn't take it out of everywhere. And that's all that was. Just a couple more, I think. Again, heavy uh, Signal 24, that's the new. Uh, that's the signal, this signal for uh, their targeting. And uh, that's it on editorial. Any questions on the editorial stuff? Kick off at seven, so I'm kind of going to hurry too. Uh, points of emphasis. Uh, these are the two points of emphasis this year. Uh, the state of the game, and of course, risk minimization. That's been huge for years. Anything getting the helmet out of the game, they're going to, they're going to, it's going to be part of uh, uh, points of emphasis forever. I think. Um, so there's a whole thing here on state of the game, and I'm not going to read, read all of it, but. Uh, as you say, there's a, a lot of teachable moments for the kids. If you want, I guess there's talk. I guess there's talk around the parts of the country of taking football out of high school because of the dangers. And this, there's a huge article on it. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you verbatim, but uh, just to say that you know, it's an important, it's an important game for kids to play. I think. Right? I, I, I didn't play at the high school level, but playing um, other sports. Uh, I know the importance of sports and in the youth growing up, you learn a lot of life lessons in that step. So uh, again, risk minimization, we're going to always talk about all this. Uh, when this stuff's a point of emphasis, guys, um, it ends up on our evaluation. So if we're not calling these illegal helmet contacts and this other stuff, we get downgraded. And you know, we, we, we as officials want to get to that championship game just as bad as you guys do, believe it or not. I mean, that's what drives us. Is, being the best official in the group and getting that big game. Okay? Uh, so when, when these directives are given to us, then we tend to, we tend to apply them. So uh, hopefully not. We hope we don't go overboard with them. Um, this is just talking about helmet, helmet contact and, and that sort of thing. Uh, reminders, again, this is just covering. These reminders are pretty much the rule changes from last year. You guys can use an iPad. In certain situations, you can't send plays in uh, from your iPad, but you can carry that big billboard, I guess, right? Um, again, if you're uh, outside the nine yard marks, you can have a tablet. If you're inside the nine yard marks and not sharing the information with the kids, you can have it. Um, inside the nine, uh, and of course, you can't share data off of an iPad or whatever inside the, the nine yard marks, inside the hashes. I don't, does anyone follow inside the hash to people have it in their ears? Um, again, the, the, the helmet rule, if the runner's helmet comes off, he's down. If another player's helmet comes off, he must uh, cease playing in the play. Uh, and, uh, and he has to leave, and he, and he has to leave for a play if the helmet did not come off because of a foul. So if he gets face masks and gets his helmet ripped off, he doesn't have to leave, providing he's okay. If the lineman is blocking, drive blocking, and his helmet comes off, is he supposed to stop? Yes. Or he gets a penalty. He can, well, he can continue the he can continue the action that he's currently doing. Right. Okay, so he can continue his block. He can't disengage and go engage someone else. Okay. Okay. He can continue to finish the block that he's doing. Um, like, again, this is showing defense. This is how many can't continue to chase to continue in the play. Uh, and this is the opposite if his helmet comes off and you hit him, the foul's on you because he's out of the play. Uh, again, the illegal blocking on the kickoff. Did you guys see any problem with get the 
this called a lot last year? Because I've never seen it as an issue in, in New Mexico, so I was kind of surprised at the rule change. Uh, anyone not understand this one? You can't block the guy until they can legally touch it. But if, uh, the last line, if, if the receivers initiate the block, then that whole thing goes away. Again, this is the same stuff that's in the slide every year. If you don't like the rules, you want to change something, this is the form, uh, nfhs.org, or it might even be on the NMA website, I'm not sure. Uh, again, uh, we have all of these uh, presentations online at the nfhs.org website. Some of the stuff's really good. I, we weren't required to go through this, but uh, I, I highly recommend it to all my uh, future veterans that they, that they go through this just to understand it. Uh, kind of a nice, nice. Um, again, just talking about managing concussions. Uh, more of the uh, heat and acclimatization stuff is on there. A lot of presentations, PowerPoints, how to, how to deal with that stuff. Um, nutrition's on there. There's, uh, I don't know if you guys look at this website. There's a ton of information for you. Uh, if you think you feel you need to get better coaching, there you go. Some instructions for you. I make all my future vets uh, go through this, take this online. It's just a good place to get started for basic information, uh, what's expected of us, that sort of thing. Uh, again, November 1st is did I turn them in. They get the end of January, they talk about it, and the rules come out in uh, July sometime. And they have a ton of stuff for all those sports. And that's it. Any questions? I got Sir. a question. Um, what, is, what is the rule for, I guess, we got called a couple of times, uh, defensive ends are pulling on the defensive end on the counter, and defensive end cuts his legs out. You can only block below the waist at, uh, at your initial charge. Defensively. You see the defensive end. The defensive end is taking the guard out. He's, he has the same requirement. His initial charge can be low. You can't delay a low block anyway. Well, the guy's pulling at him, so he's on the other side of the line running at the defensive end. He can't be got the guard, can he? No. What rule is that? Wouldn't, that, wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be initial charge. Um, is that the same for a linebacker, for a fullback coming out on it? Yeah, because you have the, the requirements. Uh, you have to be within a yard of the line of scrimmage. So a linebacker that's in a normal linebacker position is not. Uh, so the, the lineman can't cut him. Okay. Okay. Lineman can only cut lineman is the way we teach it, and it's got to be initial charge, and the ball still has to be in the zone. So uh, once if he's in shotgun, as soon as that ball snaps out of the zone. So we'll allow the, the, the initial snap, we'll allow that low block, but nothing else. Okay, even if, uh, I won't say the school, but uh, we educated them. They were three-point stance, the guy was setting up the pass block, and then they were cutting. That's right. it. It's not an initial charge. It, it used to be like where you, if you maintain contact on the shoulders, that's still, that's then, still legal. Then you could drop. Still as long as you don't, as long as you don't lose contact, if you maintain contact, that's still legal. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Good luck this year. Thank you, guys.